it's good to have like role models and admire them, but trying to mold your expectations that that's how your life should be. That's how much travel you have to do. That's the orchestras that you need to conduct. It's too toxic. Hi there, welcome back to another episode of the Conductor's Podcast. I hope you have been well and excited about maybe some summer plan to refresh and recharge yourself. Today's guest is a really long time friend. We first met in probably around 2010 when she came to audition at the graduate conducting class where I was studying at and was kept in touch throughout the Oh, no, more than a decade. And her career has really taken off, and I'm so happy and so proud of her. But today we are going to talk about something very specific, like a special part of being a conductor is about managing your time, your score, and taking care of yourself when you're always on a go. My guest today is Lina Gonzalez Glananos, and you are probably familiar with her and her many achievements. She recently just made history conducting the Chicago Symphony when stepping in for Maestro Muti when he unfortunately caught COVID, but made history as the first Latina conducting that orchestra. She is also the assistant conductor for the Philadelphia Orchestra, and she is starting her tenure with the Los Angeles Opera as their resident conductor. We had such a great time talking to each other. And as I said, we will be focusing our conversation on how do you stay organized and, you know, kind of being planning advanced when you are touring so much going from orchestra to orchestra, going from um, city to city, doing opera. And we're going to talk about how, how she organizes her trips, her mental health, and how she marks the scores. And it's such a fun conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's dive in. Hey, welcome, Lena. I'm so happy that we get to talk for the Conductor's Podcast. I can't wait for um, you to share everything with my audience. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And just to get started, I know we were talking about it. Just tell everybody how to correctly pronounce your name. That sounds good. My name is Lena Gonzalez Granados. And I was asking both the Gonzalez Granados. I hope I'm getting coming close. <laughs> are the yeah, are, are your close. last names? Yes, yes. They are actually both are my my last name. Like I want to say American last name, but yes, it's actually both my mom and my dad's last name that I hyphenated back when I became an American citizen. And they asked me what was my name or how do I wanted to be like name and I'm like well of course I want my real name which is the only name that I've had completely (laughs) you know (laughs) that's really cool so I always start asking my guests this question can you tell us a little bit about yourself how you get started and how you get to where you are right now absolutely so I am Colombian born I've been living in the United States for I think 12 years now. I moved in 2010. And I think that's when I say that I officially started the journey into conducting. It was when I actually moved to the States. And I lived for a year in New York, uh, took some classes, lessons in this education continuing education program at Julia while I was like uh, trying to figure it out my next path where I was supposed to land and by like not by by coincidence after applying to many schools I ended up doing a gig in Boston and uh, while that was happening I was like finding out that I didn't get into the schools that I was applying for so I went to I don't know a friend of mine told me about any seam and NEC also had like a continuing education, a non-master's program in conducting. And that's where I met my teacher. And I really loved 
the things that I was doing with him. He was the originally the teacher of wind ensemble conducting. And he was giving me like, I was like in literally in orchestral conducting classes and just trying to, to get a little bit more comfortable with my English and all of this until I, I said, you know what, he's actually the teacher that I've been looking for because he's so hands-on and so like open-minded. He knew that in a lot of ways I was going for wind ensemble uh, for different reasons, not necessarily to become a wind ensemble conductor, but because I actually love the repertoire and his approach to contemporary music, which was at the moment that I was in my main, like, I don't know, like main, main taste. I wanted to devote myself into contemporary music. So I started my master's there at NEC and a um, little fast forward, I started seeing, well, he said like, hey, Lina, you know, like you have a lot of talent like for opera and like for like a spoken word, like working with singers and why don't you round up your education and just you, you get a second degree in choral conducting. And you just take classes at the same time with me and the choral conducting teacher. Like that was at my second years of my master's. So at the end of the day, I ended up with a master's in wind ensemble and then a master's in choral conducting. And then more and more, I started working in chorus master roles, preparing or uh, actually doing a lot of sectionals for community orchestras, for a very high profile youth orchestra doing like percussion and woodwind sectionals and all of these. And then I said, you know what, I just need to like continue my education. And I ended up doing a doctorate in orchestral conducting and I stayed in Boston and the only one was in Boston university. So I stay there. And that's how like my education started. And thank you, Jesus. I already finished. <laughs> and in the meantime, you know, like I was working a lot, doing things, little projects, like staying in a, you know, like far away from like the mainstream, but just like working hard, very, very hard. And in the middle of that, I founded an orchestra. It is called Unitas Ensemble. It focuses on Latin American music. And that somehow attracted like other interests in me, especially repertoire wise. And that's when I met Marin Alsop and went to Cabrillo because, again, contemporary music was something very important to me. Somehow I caught her interest and I won the Taki Concordia. In that time, it was named Taki Concordia Fellowship. It was a long time ago already, like five years ago. And that's when I think like my career started, you know, in a lot of ways, very, very little thing. Then after that, working with Marin and getting to know the world in a different lens, things kind of, I don't know, I want to say exploded and it sounds terrible, but like things kind of like the universe conspired on my favor when I just like won like three major um, fellowships or assistance at the same time by major orchestras. Um, not bad design. I was looking for an assistant conducting position and they said, you know, like, I think you need a little more experience, but we want to invest in your talent because actually I think you have more to give than just being a runner up and go for another job. We just want to keep you. And that's what happened. And so I went to Seattle and first Seattle and Philly. And that was like, I, I don't know, in a you know how it is that it's like an application, like at least for myself, I was, you know, applying for everything and then having ups and downs. Uh, I remember when I, I always tell the story like this is like when I was applying to Philly and Chicago, I applied the same day, you know, like sending like all the um, resumes and everything was after a very low week that I got rejections from like a lot of places that way minor than this, you know, way minor than Chicago and Philly for sure. And it was like these orchestras would not even like look at my resume or my videos because you can see, you know, in analytics and in that time that you can see who watches your video or not. Nobody would even watch my video or dare to see my resume. Um, why? I don't know. That's their own biases for them to discover. But then somehow I got at the same time and also I applied at the same day and at the same day I got 
like an email from Chicago and an email from Philly that they accepted me and to apply for the audition. And in Chicago was a competition actually. And, you know, things conspired to just, I don't know, I won the three, three of them in that regards. And that's how like my, I don't know, my career started and my experiences started to gain a little bit more visibility. And now I'm working full time as a conductor and freelance a lot, but more like a staff at this moment in Philly and Chicago. Yes, that's wonderful. And I remember you want those sort of major jobs, um, jobs with major organizations kind of right before pandemic. So how did that affect you since with assistantship, you are going with their calendar, assistant covering. How was it? Well, you know, it it was definitely a very low to see the, the pandemic shutting things down. But in a lot of ways, um, I think the job got a little more intense in some of them. Um, so, for example, I think in Seattle, I had more opportunity to conduct that I was previously a schedule in the first uh, year that I was there. Because, I mean, I think the first thing is that in Seattle, I conducted like three weeks right before the pandemic started. So they were able to see me after the audition. I think it would have been very different if that was the case. And the reaction was very positive with the orchestra. So they got me for other like audio videos. And, you know, I got to be with the orchestra, get to know the people, uh, be very involved and they gave me a lot of opportunities and I'm actually coming back to Seattle next season for a subscription concert which I think it's a huge gain and in terms of Philly the same happened I was actually the week before the pandemic doing my first concert and then before that I had like two major covers cover weeks one which was with well with Yannick I worked very hard like very closely and then one with Marin, actually. And in those uh, projects, I was heavily involved. So for the pandemic in Philly, actually, we did like the digital stage and the digital stage involved being two weeks or three weeks at a time assisting. You know, we would uh, divide our uh, work with Erina, the in residence assistant conductor, because it was too much. It was like, on my part, I was covering for 40 pieces on the week, 40 wow. pieces. It was crazy, you know, and she was covering other 40. So that meant that we were doing 75 pieces. So it was like sometimes five to 10 pieces a day because that was how intense was the schedule. And of course we conducted. So the work was so intense that the relationship got like the covering relationship Definitely very different, but very close with William Nick, the music director. So, you know, for me, the work was very intense, even though it was more scattered. It wasn't in residence all day. It didn't, in my case, as an independent contractor, because, I mean, I'm a staff, but my contract is different. So that means that less work weeks to be paid for, but like more work to be done. So the, the volume was gigantic. And in terms with Chicago, Chicago was completely shut down. So when I started, I mean, it, it, it was a little bit lamentable um, at the beginning because I started the job because of the strike. The audition was late on the beginning of the season. So I auditioned in November where the audition was in like uh, supposedly to be in March to start the complete season. So I started in November and then I came here for three weeks of repertoire with Maestro, which was very hands off. And it, my contract at the, actually, it's more about, it's called an apprenticeship. So it's more like I get to go and learn from Maestro and observe, which is an absolute honor and pleasure and, you know, privilege honestly, to just sit down there. But then then the pandemic happened and they canceled the entire season and a little bit more. So nothing for me, no videos, no nothing, no contact with Maestro, nothing. So that means that that was like a big hiatus 
there. But then this year I started like it was my first year, like almost officially. And then he wasn't going to stay one more year, but he extended a year for his final contract because it was also that I was going to be his last apprentice here. And here now with COVID, things had gotten a little bit different in Chicago. So actually he was sick a couple of weeks ago with COVID. So I had to step in, which wasn't not like, it's really what an assistant does and what I do, but it wasn't even in my contract. So they just, they actually revisited like my role in a lot of ways after I had to, they had to see me and I had to step in and, and now I'm having like a more hands-off process and I'm going to be conducting off stage. You know, I've been conducting more than I, I thought I was going to be. So it's a lot, but now it feels a little more like and more normal in that sense, just like too many heads in different places. Yeah, that's that's hard because, as I say, a lot of major orchestras, if they were able, they went into video or audio recording and live streaming and a lot of more online activities during the pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience during those recordings? And as you say, like it's very intense sometimes because they need to get musicians in and to get the audio engineering is there to record all day, very different programs. Do you feel that you would, would work differently with the musicians if it was like a recording project as opposed to doing a regular concert? Oh, absolutely. It's very different and very intense. Everybody does it in a different way. I mean, I did a couple of them with other orchestras conducting on my own, and I did it very different. And it depends on, A, the quality of recording injury nearing that you have and you know also the quality of orchestras that you have so in a lot of sense an orchestra which such high quality as as philly they just the way that it worked was that you would do a movement rehearse a movement and then record it right away so you didn't have i mean it was almost ready when you pass. So there was no time. And also that means that the preparation has to be extremely rigorous because it's there is little to no time to react. You're working almost in like orchestra, I mean, in regular orchestral schedule, like you're rehearsing a piece, but then you're just recording, you know, rehearsing, recording, rehearsing, recording, like entire programs. So it's very rigorous. And then the other ones, yes, they would need more time, you know, say they would have more days. Like I, I went a couple of weeks, you know, for places where you go like two days and then you would do recording because they need more time. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. So it does depend, but yeah, you have to prepare the pieces equally. And even if, and when we were covering what we had is that um, we were guiding the cameras as well. So there was one on site to do audio, help with audio. And the other one was on the other floor. You know, we were always like covering, but our covering duties were different. So for example, the person who was guiding our audio was in charge of like the official cover, I'm going to say. You know, we were like two covers, for example. And in that one, for example, the official cover would mark the score and give it to the other cover. So the other cover wouldn't have to mark the score Again, you know, really. and then you would guide the cameras would say, you know, 15 minutes before is like, I don't know, but soon all the camera things. So you would do the two jobs, not on, like the audio. It was very, very efficient and <laughs> very intense. The four, like five weeks, the more five weeks that I've learned. And also for me, it was a huge advantage because in my calendar, when in the calendar of the orchestra, a pre-pandemic, I was scheduled to conduct and I was scheduled to cover, for example, the music director a couple of times, but, you know, we were two people, we are two people. So the other had more weeks because she's in residence. So in that sense, that means that I got equal amount of time to spend learning from Yannick. And for me, that was incredibly valuable, you know, as a musician. Because at the end, what do you go for those jobs? Like, it's just to grow. I mean, of course, you need a lot of things, but it's more about growing up into the repertoire, looking how orally it sounds with a major orchestra, 
and just like taking those experiences with you and then applying it to your own work as guest conductor or music director in a different orchestra. So it was huge. Totally. And I'm curious, I'm sure a lot of my audience will share this with me. So when you have to prepare such huge amount of repertoire and be so rigorous and kind of really on top of it, because like usual covering, you're maybe there just taking notes, but now you're in charge of the camera. You're in charge of the, you're working with someone, someone depends on you. How do you study or like, how do you, how do you study differently or like kind of prepare yourself to be that ready and, and such short amount of time? For me, I don't know. I think before, now that I'm like a little more in charge of other things, it was more about establishing priorities, what, what was needed. So for example, if I needed to just market, it was, you know, like, of course I knew how the pieces would have to go, but it was just like a, like a very mechanical process that you use all your a priori knowledge you know, of like you trust that you know the piece more or less and you, you mark it and guide and make them up for people. For me, that is not a particularly like studious. It's not like the same preparation, but when I do cover, I do study at the same level of depth that I would conduct because I've already been in those like times like scared <laughs> Like, oh, Lina, you might be able, you might need to conduct. And some of them have been major pieces and the anxiety and freak out of, oh my God, I did, I just like mark my score is not worth like my, my nerves. So I just, at this moment, and I mean, this is like my ideal life, but not like how it's happening right now because of balance and everything. I do have like a calendar that I work like the layers of depth. I mean, I realized that I can't study a piece, you know, in a week. Like I won't learn it in a week or in two weeks, you know, I need a little more time, especially major pieces. So major pieces and contemporary pieces stay a little bit longer on my calendar, like almost three, four months uh, in advance. And I just take a really heavy bag sometimes. Now I'm just like trying to mess with my technology app and marking my scores in my iPad and then printing the scores in color because also saves me space and, you know, carrying the, the scores, especially the ones that I know I won't buy like good versions of it or like that I won't invest, you know, three or four hundred dollars on a book. So I just mark it and then print it when I need it in color. And that actually gives me a lot of time and actually makes me very portable. But I spend a lot of time, you know, I have a very strict calendar with a checklist. And I say, you know, today I'm going to do like a marathon on this piece. And I just do the, and, and the things like, I'm very now like my systems of marking and the system of what I need to learn is very ingrained in my in my brain, you know, I now respond very easily to markings. So it's just like one day I just mark it and don't study it, you know, just like mark it. And then the other day I would go and really see, okay, what did I mark? What I, what did I miss? You know, all of these. And then the reading. So it's, I go into real depth for a long period of time. And now I think the most that I'm trying to find, like the balance is between opera because opera is a different world and uh, which is the one that I am now going towards a little bit deeper. And I've realized that there is more to it. <laughs> Not, <laughs> you know, like, of course, yes. everybody tells you, everybody tells you, but it's like, yeah, you just have to deal with so much so much chaos sometimes that you just have to be very, very sure of what you want. Yeah, that's that's the thing I'm also kind of learning because with opera, that I think I have a good idea with symphonic repertoire. I like you say I'm skilled and experienced enough to know what I'm what, what I need to know before going to rehearsal. But then with opera, there are just more moving parts and more unexpected part. So like the more I prepare for it, the more unprepared I feel I am. I was like, oh, I'm still finding out things that I wasn't comfortable with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Out. <laughs> exactly. But do you mind sharing a little bit about your marking system since you say you use color? 
like do you have specific do you use color pencils and red and blue only or more colors for different instruments um do you might just tell us a little bit about your secret of course the biggest secret that i could share with you is that i'm completely non-committal to my markings like my markings don't mean a thing for years in the longer scheme i always well not not always treat myself like the score as a black canvas because then if you have markings that are good then you know you just don't have to do it again but sometimes they're so bad so in that sense i always use erasable tools all the time so i have erasable markers erasable highlighters erasable pens all erasable everything which since the day that i discovered them i actually it was back in 2013 believe it or not for a Cenerentola that I went to study in Cincinnati. I don't know if I actually saw you there, but I, yeah. No, I wasn't so, there, but I heard about you going there for the summer. Yeah, exactly. So I went there and, you know, like trying to prepare for it. And I found those like erasable markers. And from that day, my life completely changed because then I just, you know, like I use them. And if I make mistakes, I just erase them and just change the way I think. That is one thing that I do. The other thing that I, I mean, that's like for my personal markings. When I am covering, I do have also my system of post-its and some post-its, you know, like I use like those like very bland yellow ones for like my notes of things that could be going wrong or right. And the other ones like different colors, uh, different lengths and different colors and different things mean to me. You know, like I use, for example, post-its for, uh, I have different bowings, for example, for different orchestras that I see. So I just put the different bowings or I don't know. I'm just like trying to think what do I have or comments that I see on books that I like and just put it on, you know, like, oh, someone say this about this piece. And I just put it there, just like a repository of information that I can go and take a look that is not necessarily into the score, that I can take it easily if it's very busy, you know? Uh, so post-its and erasable markers is my go-to. I always use, you know, red for cues, blue for articulations, and sometimes I use a uh, blue for pizzicato. I actually mark them like this, <laughs> like a little little brackets on the pizzicato so I know like not all pizzicato but where does it, it start it's very uh, and then I always use like acid pink which is like my like my own uh, for key change I have always used acid pink you know I always use acid pink for key change you know bars green for structural changes or tempo changes like vertical and I use like a very nasty orange just to separate scores, you know, like staffs in the same page. Because when I don't do that, I always pass the page. I'm just like, go, and then it's like, oh my God, I miss like 20 bars, you know? So I know that th those are, for example, the things that I need because I'm, uh, when I'm like uh, going through the score and rehearsing, I go like maybe 10 or 15 bars, you know, ahead. I, you know, I'm never read it like on the, when, when you're conducting. So I just need to know, like, especially where I am. Basically, is that it's just like to guide myself, especially. And then when the scores are very populated, you know, that it has very too many layers and the layers are doubled and everything. I use highlighters to just get a it really depends on the piece. Some pieces are it's not that they're more organized, but less colorful than others. And, you know, and. That's pretty much it. I don't know what pink. I, I use like a purple sometimes for a mix meter. Oh, uh, for I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Yeah. What I do with mix meter is, for example, if a movement is like in eights, you know, five, six, eights, I use like always the same one, which is, I don't know, purple. And then when it's like a three, four or something different, I just use a different color. So I know that it's, I cannot immediately like i have to think about which if i'm conducting in quarters or if, what is the you know the common denominator so i just use a different color and one thing i'm always curious 
to ask my colleagues is, what do you do with the, the compound meters? So say like a seven, eight, but it's two, three, two or three, two, two. Like, how do you mark those little things? Do you use the triangle or do you write the numbers? Actually, I use both because on, and, and it depends. For example, it depends on the piece. I use the triangles or, a, you know, close to a percussion and then the numbers up. So if I have to ever go, you know, like if I ever have to change between, you know, spaces of the score, I know the information and, you know, what what is like, yeah. But for, I, yeah, it depends. I mean, it's a work in progress. I cannot say that it's sometimes like, why did I do this? Like, why am I, I doing know. this for myself? But, but I think now I've discovered that I need, for example, the markings of seven eight and three eight or all of these with the colors in different parts of the score because sometimes if I go here and I miss one like I want to have all the information where my attention should be for example if my it's a flute and I don't know timpani kind of thing you know that it goes like this like I want to know exactly what is happening in both planes. So I just don't have to go look for the information and look like I'm like losing my mind with my eyes, you know, look a little bit, you know, in that sense. So it's like the more that I market, the more comfortable I feel that I need the score less. It's weird. It's just how my brain works. Yeah, it's like marking it as a way of helping you internalize all the information. So Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I don't think there is a fixed way. Mm -hmm. I, I think whoever tells you that it's that something is fixed, then they really don't know how the, <laughs> the brain works because every brain is different. You know, some people, I mean, for me, it's like the more amount of information that helps me focus telling the story horizontally, the better. Like for me, it's like all about how do I tell the story? You don't tell the story, you know, like this. So for me, it's a little more horizontal thinking, you know, the way that I think about marking my scores. So that's why I need that information. But I remember once having this experience, which marked me forever, really. Um, it was a very bad one. But I remember one day going to a master class in a very famous space and the conductor saw my score is like, oh, you know, your brain doesn't work because your score is marked. And he said it in front of everyone. And wow. I mean, I was so offended. But then I was like, dude, like, really, can you say that? And then, like, I look at a score. So my bosses, <laughs> like, major, major, uh, major conductors, and I see they're just... <laughs> marking scribbles even his boss and i'm like dude like honestly is this like what you want to say to someone like for me it's like there is no way the only way for you to internalize the music it's so personal like nobody can tell you you know how your memory works you can use things that make you organize but at the end the story the only one responsible in the podium is you and you're the only one who can tell the story better than anyone so whatever you do you do yeah totally i had a similar experience it was many many years ago when i was looking for conducting programs so i visited a very famous school with a very famous prestigious teacher so like i know someone that was in his studio so they invited me just kind of to sit in doing the conducting lesson to see if that's somewhere i wanted to apply to and they were doing a Beethoven symphony and he look at my score and he say, no, that's totally wrong. Beethoven never has a um, seven bar phrase. There's no three bar thing. It's always two or four. So it's four or six or eight. You can't have seven in Beethoven. I was like, really? There are some like pivotal moments. I, and I can think it's a seven or like a, a three here kind of overlapping this way and then just like from a very famous teacher telling me that all my thinking was like totally wrong I was, I was a little crushed that day <laughs> but no but it's true it's like and then you see major major conductors and they don't mark the scores like that just go go to a new york philharmonic archives and it's like they don't do four by four because it's the only way that they, you can do it it's like how you hear it how you feel the harmony like honestly if you can't connect 
your visual to your hearing or your visual to your physical, then you can't tell the story. And that's what I think like a lot of score study fails, especially on the like on the bigger stages and in the bigger level when you have to really deliver. And you don't deliver a four-bar phrase. You deliver an idea, a philosophy, an inspiration, a framework for people to get inspired and play their best. Like, who cares if it's a four-bar phrase? You know, like, you have to care because you need to know, like, how are the, like, harmonic tensions and everything. But that comes from a rigorous study of the harmony. And sometimes harmony, I mean, it's like... Beethoven, even Mozart and everything. The way that they, they are geniuses is because they don't do four by four by four by four by four by four, tan tan, the end. I mean, honestly, Beethoven five, first five bars, honestly. <laughs> you know, no, I I, 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 I know. Totally. It's like, if you say that, that's why maybe you're in a school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like now that we are like older enough to say this is like, yeah, we just find, I remember all the time, like, um, someone very, very, very famous saying like, oh no, the phrase goes here because here is the rehearsal number. And I'm like, dude, this is definitely not like a teacher that I want. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt. I was like, I don't want to come here and study with someone telling me that you you can have a three bar phrase. But anyways, I, I was really curious about your journey because I knew you were kind of after pandemic is a little better now. And so I always feel very nervous saying things like that because whenever we feel things are getting better, some part in the world, it's they have like <laughs> all great and things. But I know that you had an intense international travel that you didn't get home for several months. And how was that like? Well, I mean, I haven't got home since January 17. I have been home like only for, I don't know, stretches of five days at a time, which sucks. <laughs> but, you know, it was very interesting to now travel in a pandemic world with a new sense of, well, not new, like a renewed sense of compromise for the environment as well and feeling all these pressures that I put on myself to actually like be responsible with my carbon footprint and And all of that. So it was very intense. Some of the, I learned a lot, learned a lot about the intensity that it requires to be away, you know, physically, mentally, also the logistic that goes, you know, with that, which sometimes is very, you know, like, I think there's a lot of lessons learned, like a lot, a lot of them. And it was intense, and now I'm go. I'm going back. I'm leaving Chicago. I've been here for two weeks. Uh, weirdly er- er- enough, it feels like home. But I'm going back home for Sunday and Monday for my birthday, and then I'm leaving for <laughs> until almost October. Like really, so I'm just a little bit scared that it's not going to to work the way that I want, but I mean, I'm planning, I'm planning ahead a lot. So we've been talking about kind of planning ahead a little bit through the score study. And that's one of the thing that takes the most time if you do it right. (laughs) Of course, some people fake and then it's always obvious if you fake through it, it's just very unprofessional in my opinion. But as I say, like when you are on the way, you have so much to prepare um, there projects after projects and now you are using your ipad or like the digital scores to study are you often able to decide what repertoire that you want to conduct if you're guest conducting can you repeat some of them or do you try not to repeat like how does that work well it's it's really a conversation of how much can you tackle I think this is what my manager and myself, we call like a year of self-reckoning. He has been telling me that I need to slow down a little bit more. But of course, like if you come out of a pandemic and then (laughs) you have these weeks, it's like, well, I'm just going to see how much I can put on my calendar because it's, it's for me, it's been, you know, like the difference between me and some of the conductors that are, like new is that I didn't come from an orchestral conducting background like since this since school so it's not that I've been like seeing these pieces totally 
like like I have to actually learn on the job, which is and sometimes like for women, this is like such a an important lesson because we don't get hands on the major pieces in school that much than other students or depending on the school, you know, it's, it, it does depend. So for me, it wasn't the case. So I've been, I'm going crazy putting some scores. I have to say that I did one that, I mean, I, I'm trying to repeat as much. I try to repeat as much a couple of major pieces that I know that would be good for debuts. So I just, uh, so if I have a major debut, I always put the piece before in a, an orchestra that doesn't have in that much pressure, but I can experiment more or I, that I have more rehearsal time, for example. So there is like, that is the strategic planning, you know, but in some of them, I don't get to choose. You know, most of the time I don't get to choose the soloist because at this moment, like 90% of the time, the soloists are more famous. So I just get to go with the flow. I do have like a couple of pieces that I have realized that I can't do yet or that I don't want to do. So I just say, no, if this is the piece that the soloist wants, uh, thank you. It's not the gig for me. Or please change the soloist or please, you know, like let's ch- like reconsider the date. Um I don't know. It's a 50, 50. I think pre pandemic, I had less time to choose now, uh, like uh, leeway to choose. Now I have more say. And, you know, when it's a subscription concert now that I'm getting more subscriptions going back 22, 23, 23, 24, like I get to choose more, but before it wasn't. So I'm a little stuck with a couple of pieces there here and there. And I think this is going to be like the, this next month is going to be the, the biggest one. In the last one, I had like five Scheherazades or like, like <laughs> four Scheherazades, which was amazing. I actually loved it because it's a very difficult piece and everybody has their own challenges on how to tackle the piece, like orchestra wise. But this, in three weeks, I'm doing Chostakovich five. I'm doing Enigma. I'm doing... Chostakovich cello concerto, Walton cello concerto. I don't even know. Pastoral. I have so many pieces I don't even remember. Yeah, something like that. While preparing for Lucia in October. I didn't get to choose before. Now I have to get to choose. And that's one thing that I learned a lot that I need to speak up of my needs, which I didn't. I mean, you don't know what your needs are if you have never lived through it, or at least I haven't. A lot of people told me, but for me, it's like, oh, unless I experience it, I can't totally say that this is cor- like this is what I need or not need. And that was a big, big mistake. If someone tells you, you know, like, take it easy, don't go, like, it's going to be hard, like, please measure yourself, you know, then maybe you should listen to them because they have more experience. But for me, it was that trying to keep a uh, very like a mental health regime where I feel comfortable because it's very exhausting. And what do I do to guard myself and my, not my, yeah, my energies, you know, my energy deposit, because sometimes you get also, you know, the stamina of doing the concerts one by one, but also the mental strength that you requires to be in front of people that you don't know and you don't know how they're going to react with you. That's another thing. And then on top of that, like the, the physical logistics of travel, which I think are the worst, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the one hack that I actually love to share, because I think it has been life changing for everyone that I've said it, is that I lost my bag in the middle of a yeah, trip. Yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> that was a mess, you know, like, so the thing that I had is like on me was my scores but I didn't have concert clothes because I put it everything on my back. I didn't have like a pajama or something. So even if it's heavy, please put like a pair of, you know, decent clothes for your rehearsal the next day, if your back doesn't appear. And the thing that someone told me that I was like, okay, this is a lifesaver is that I bought these Apple trackers, like air tags, and they tell you exactly where your bags are. So it's like, oh, it's getting out of the of the flight. It's not getting out. It's closer to you or it's 
in the middle of Spain. Because like I lost my back three times. Three times, you know, one, the worst was that it was 13 days without clothes. So I had actually had to go and buy everything because even though, I mean, I was like, okay, uh, yeah, I just needed to go. And it was amazing, you know, like I, I refused to go clothes for the, because I don't want to spend that much money on things I already have, but I had to do it, you know? So I just like went crazy and bought myself like an entire wardrobe including concert clothes. You know, it was crazy. I was so happy. My credit card wasn't, but I was so happy. But then I bought the air tax and I was like, I would call it like, hey, it's in Madrid. I know what, where the anger is. Bring me my bag. And they were like, oh, okay. You know, so it really, it really works. You can actually make, because sometimes of those reclamations, they're like, oh, we don't know where it is. It's in the middle of Poland. And we don't know, maybe the tag left. And I'm like, oh my God, it was so nerve wracking. You know, like all of these like practical things. And now the more that I can travel now that I'm having a little more like my parents just retired last week. So I, I know that at least myself, I don't thrive in loneliness. You know, I do need someone to help me navigate the bad parts of the business and that is like a very tight circle and those are my parents when my husband can't so now they're going to Europe with me and we're making like a trip out of them or out of it and they're going to do their own thing but at least I get to just have someone that I get to talk to because I spend too much time lonely and it's not in my personality to be happy because I'm I'm lonely I mean, I'm, I'm the happiest when I'm with people that I love or that I can trust. So that has been important to know, like, what are my, my needs? You know, like I need my diet coke or I need my water or I need to not travel one day, like at night and arrive to rehearse the next day at 10 a.m. Like I can't do it. You know, all of this that I, that I need to be vocal. Nobody is a mind reader. So you just have to say, you know, this is what I need. And if they don't like it, it's not a good fit, you know? And then you just have to go through it. You know, it's hard to ask for things that you need and want, you know, but it's necessary. Otherwise, you cannot do your job correctly. I totally understand. I used to think that I would be, I think I did several of those trips back when I was still a student. I would fly to, workshops like to save money this is to fly at a very terrible time arrive at 6 a.m going to master class like 10 a.m and you can't check into the hostel yet and it looks like i know I, I i literally learned i need to just get fresh take a shower present myself well instead of just trying to go straight to work but yeah nobody's yeah, but- forcing you to be a martyr why would you force to you to be a martyr? Nobody wants that version of yourself when you are like suffering. Well, some of them don't. But how do you manage to keep your focus on your project? Say like you're traveling, you're now in Chicago. You have to focus for your job here, but you also have to study for your work next week or three months now, something, a bigger work, a major work, an opera, a new opera you never conducted before that seems very far away, but you knew that you need a lot of time to get into it. Like, how do you manage the time when you are on, just always on a go? I think I've realized that I can't plan too much in advance. You know, like I do things in advance, but I don't plan the day in advance because my days are very fluid. So, for example, sometimes I know my schedule two days or three days in advance. For example, next week I'm going to be in New York and I just found out what are my travel times and everything. So as soon as I know where my travel days fit, you know, I start planning around it. And when I have the schedule, I am an early riser, very, very, very early riser. I wake up every day at five and by six, I'm already studying, you know? So I generally use the morning for a, I would say, immediate studying. And then come home, 
binge watch TV or do something that just disconnects me a little and then start studying in the afternoon, you know. It's, the, the days are long. It's not a nine to five, unfortunately, if I want to keep like the layers. But I do, I think the thing that I'm trying to, to put more on my schedule are just like passes, you know, like passes, like active passes and, and that. But yes, I do plan my days to the to the minute sometimes because I simply don't have the time, even though I wish to, you know, and it goes against totally of my personality. If it was like my own doing, I would only study when the inspiration strikes because I'm a very free, you know, like I don't like grocery lists or schedules or agendas and as I told you like it's like please you know happy to help you with the podcast but remind me every day <laughs> because of that very and then I arrive late you know <laughs> it's just I have to structure myself which is what I've never done in my life in we Colombians are like, I had a very, you know, we don't even have seasons. We don't have to plan for different weather. We have the perfect weather all the time. You know, let's go to the woods. Let's go to the pool. Let's do, you know, like always like whatever the mood strikes in order for this to work, I have to just work against what, <laughs> you know, myself. And it helps me, you know, it's like this kind of order sets me free more like the same as my markings the more I mark, the freer I get because the more information I can get in my brain is the same. I think the more structure I have, the more freer I am. Like a kid. <laughs> I know I was going to ask about that because I love planning, but I'm very bad at sticking to my plans. <laughs> oh, yes, me too. So how do you motivate yourself? I was like, okay, I just want to watch one more episode of something or listen to the music. But now I, I know I really have to go study or not. I really have to go do this. Otherwise, we'll regret the letter. For me, it's that. I mean, I, I, it's a little bit of a fear induced and regret, which is not positive, but it's the things that I, it work. Like, I, I mean, I still sometimes like go against my schedule more times than I want to. But at the same time... Like I try to have at least a minimum, you know, that I just like that my minimum is that I don't compromise because I remember when how it feels when things like how I felt when things went wrong. What were my feelings, you know, and if it, you know, sometimes life gets in the way, like we're talking about, like about this in a very, you know, um, a sterile way. Like life di didn't happen, like you didn't have a family emergency or you didn't get sick or, you know, like kids or whatever or illness. There's so many things, husband, like all of these. Um, those are like very sterile ideas that I try to put on my calendar. But if I really need the time, I just take it, you know, or and then I'll put it somewhere else. Like I don't feel guilty to give myself Time to watch my novella at 5 a.m. Like, why, why would I guilt myself as long as I do the job? That's totally true. So just to wrap up our conversation, what's the most important thing that you felt you learned or that, or that you want to share with my audience or things that you want everybody to be kind of look out for, watch out? <laughs> watch out, I mean, in terms of planning and traveling, I would say that... Always sit down and have like a hard look of yourself and your needs and see what do you need? How much time do you need to be prepared for something like mentally? You know, like if you need your itineraries before, like if you need, I mean, I have privilege that I have a team, but sometimes you don't have a team. So when you don't have a team or you have to corral your team, all of these, you just have to know what do you need? When do you need it? Why do you need it? And how, you know, like all the things, but always be very, I mean, ask for the most things that you can instead of trying to please anybody and to accommodate everybody. I think that's the most important thing because if you can't do your job correct because your mind is somewhere else, then people are losing and you are losing. So much stress, it doesn't mean, doesn't have to be like that. 
I think that's the the one. And then with preparing, I think it's the same. You know, like have a hard look of what you need. Not everybody needs the same amount of time to study, but if you want to be rigorous of your training as a conductor, that requires time, you know. Like even the greatest conductors need more time. And if you need to take less work because you need more time, that is okay too. You know, even in this absolutely capitalist world where you, you know, need to pay your bills and everything, like don't get gigs just because you have to pay your bills. Because if a gig of that goes wrong, then you're closing the door. So whatever you can do to make yourself feel comfortable and freer, the more that you can do the better. And then for conducting, I don't know if that's something that you're interested in in doing, but I would say that as much as role models that you can get, don't ever think that their work will be the same as yours and create your own path. It's good to have like role models and admire them, but trying to mold your expectations that that's how your life should be. That's how much travel you have to do. That's the orchestras that you need to conduct. It's too toxic. Just like trust the process, you know, trust that the path that you are, if that's the one that you want, it's going to show up. That's wonderful. I thank you so much for being here with me. Of course, I'm very, very happy that you invited me. And I hope, I mean, we, we rumble a lot. So I hope you can get, like, there is something valuable into all of this that we talk. No, 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 that's totally wonderful. So I will put this in the show notes, but I wanted the audience to hear it from you. Can you just share where everybody can find you, reach out to you on social media or your website? Absolutely. I think the easiest way to reach me is on Instagram or on Twitter, because now I am a little bit like out of Facebook, but I still, you know, it's connected. But if someone wants to talk to me, I'm actually very reachable via my Instagram, which is Linita Conductor. And uh, yes, and if the conversation gets closer, I'll give you my deeds like you have, you know. <laughs> oh, you know, the, there is another uh, advice. Yes, please. So I think, like, don't complicate your life. Like, the most amount of things that you can do to not complicate your life that are ethical to your core values, the better. For example, like, even, like, buying clothes for conducting and all of these and being glamorous and blah, blah, blah. Like, for me, it's just about what can I do to spend less amount of time washing and ironing, you know, like honestly, because I'm like traveling it's so all the hard time. to buy them. <laughs> yeah, no, but but it's like I have been trying very hard to not like overspend and overconsume because I mean also like the weight in my bag, you know, carrying like a night like a fifty pound bag already full with scores, you know, you just have to know to compromise. So just making sure that you're mi- mindful of what, yeah, exactly. Uh, in that realm of what are your needs how can you just like be ethical with the environment it's so important thank you so much i love this conversation so much and thank you so much again of course happy to do it Here you go, my friends. And I hope you love this conversation as much as I did, because, you know, even though I've known Lena for so many years, it's really rare that we start with our colleagues and talk about things. You know, like sometimes you meet each other, have small conversation about, hey, what's up and catch up on things. But this podcast really gave me an opportunity as well to speak with my colleagues about our profession you know, things that I might have missed or sometimes we find shared experiences and it's such a wonderful thing. And I'm so grateful for you to be here to be sharing this with me. I loved how she talked about how she marks her scores. I'm not such a colorful person. I like my score to be really neat and I used to mostly just use pencil. I'm very rarely red and blue. But as she said, you have to do whatever that works for you. And I also loved how she reminds all of us, B 
be protective of yourself because you have to be the one that's looking out for yourself first. Know what you need to enable you to be the best you can, and that's actually really responsible for you and for any organization, any musicians, any people that you work with. I hope that you loved our conversation, and if you would please leave a review on Apple Podcast, because that's also a way for me to reach out to a greater audience and the community. Thank you so much, and I will see you next week at the same time, same place. Bye for now. Thank you.